Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, today is known as Palm Sunday. It's named after the day when Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, greeted by people waving palm branches and laying their garments on the road. They proclaimed him as king. Thou art the king of Israel, we sang. Thou David's royal son, who in the Lord's name comest, thou king and blessed one. Now what a contrast with our text for this morning. Jesus entered the city with honor, but now he leaves the city in dishonor. There the people wave palm branches. Here Christ carries a cross. There they lauded him as the king of Israel, and now they mock him with the title king of the Jews. There they took off their garments to make a royal carpet for him. And here now they take off his garments as plunder for the soldiers. Great contrasts. And they strike us. And surely they would have struck the Jews of that time as well. Yet these are contrasts for people, not for God. The Sovereign Lord is behind both events. After all, Palm Sunday and Good Friday are connected. It is not so that Palm Sunday is about triumph and Good Friday is about humiliation. No, both events have to do with the suffering of Christ. Yes, also the triumphal entry. Jesus knew that he was coming to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. The very same people who escorted him to Jerusalem to crown him as king would lead him out again to crucify him. After the processional of honor would come a recessional of dishonor. And that was God's purpose, to dishonor his son. Christ knew it, and he submitted to God's will. He went into Jerusalem so that he might be cast out. This morning I summarized the gospel as follows. The sovereign Lord dishonors his royal son for our comfort. And we will see that the son is first of all dismissed, secondly discredited, and thirdly disrobed. Our text for this morning begins in verse 16 with the words, Then he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Who is the them? To whom did Pilate deliver Jesus? Well, first we might think that it is the Roman soldiers. They took charge of Jesus and they crucified him. And yet the soldiers are not mentioned at the beginning of our text. And notice that the end of verse 15 mentions the chief priests. The chief priest said, we have no king but Caesar. And then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus and led him away. Now, of course, the chief priests did not crucify him themselves because they wanted to stay clean in order to celebrate the Passover. The soldiers did the dirty work. Why then does John's gospel put it this way, that Pilate delivered Jesus to the chief priests? Well, these words show that they had gotten their way. They had forced Pilate's hand so that he condemned a man to death whom he had found innocent of every crime. It was an act of surrender on Pilate's part. He gave them what they wanted. But there's more to it than that. This was not simply a Jewish mob that was out to lynch the Lord Jesus. No, these were chief priests, office bearers in the Old Testament church, experts in the law of God. It was their task to make sure that God's law was carried out to the letter, and they knew the letter of the law. And you remember what they said to Pilate when he had said for the third time, I find no fault in him. Then the chief priest said in verse 7, We have a law, 
And according to our law, he must die because he made himself the son of God. And that was the turning point of the trial. Then Pilate became afraid. Son of God, after all, was a title that Caesar used for himself. So if Pilate would refuse to condemn someone who called himself the Son of God, then Pilate's own loyalty to Caesar could be called into question. And so Pilate felt cornered. He condemned Jesus not because he believed him to be guilty, but to save his own skin. But as far as the chief priests were concerned, Jesus was being condemned to death for blasphemy. And so they took Jesus and they led him away out of the city. That's what the law required. Leviticus 24 verse 13. The blasphemer had to be put to death outside the camp, excluded from the congregation, excluded from fellowship with God. And then Leviticus 24 adds in verse 15, whoever curses God shall bear his sin. Now there you might have expected a word of protest from the lips of our Savior. You might have expected him to say, Lord, I, I have no sin. I did not curse you. I spoke nothing but the truth. Lord, are you going to listen to those unbelieving chief priests instead of to your own son? But Jesus kept silent. He went as a lamb to the slaughter. He submitted without protest to the law that said, whoever curses God shall bear his sin. By accepting a death which he did not deserve, the Lord Jesus bore sins which he did not commit. And so he became a sacrifice for sin, a lamb loaded down with the sins of God's people. And here, brothers and sisters, you see the magnitude of what the chief priests were doing. It was their task as priests to take sin out of the presence of holy God. And they did that when they led Jesus out of the city. But whose sin was Jesus carrying? That's the question that makes all the difference in the world. If the Lord Jesus was guilty of blasphemy, then he would die in accordance with Leviticus 24. But if he was innocent and he still allowed himself to be led out of the city, then he would die in accordance with Isaiah 53. And in, I, and in that chapter we read this, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. Brothers and sisters, do you see what your Savior has done for you? He was already exhausted and badly wounded from Pilate's scourging. He was accused of sins that he had not committed. He was betrayed and abandoned and condemned. And if he had spoken just one word of protest, he would have been spared because God is just. But the Lord Jesus kept silent and he went as a lamb, knowing that for him to protest now would be to refuse the task which his father had appointed for him. And so he allowed himself to be removed from God's presence outside the camp, knowing full well that the curse of God forsakenness was waiting for him there. He was dismissed for our comfort, bearing our sins. Bearing his cross, we read in verse 17. Now the other gospels tell us that the soldiers compelled Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross. But John leaves that part of the story out 
He wants us to know that the Lord Jesus had the wooden cross on his own back and that he so fulfilled the prophecy that Abraham had made so long ago in Genesis 22. In the same general area, when Abraham's son Isaac, carrying the wood on his back, asked his father, My father, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Then Abraham replied, My son, God will provide the lamb himself. And now here comes the lamb in our text. Walking out of the gates which he had entered just five days before, he had entered the Lord's gate so that the Lord might dismiss him from his presence and send him to Golgotha. Golgotha means the place of a skull. It's a gruesome name, isn't it? Some people, might, uh, some people think that it was so named because so many people had been executed there. It was a place of skulls. Others think, however, that this was a hill that looked a bit like a skull with a bare top where nothing would grow. Golgotha, in any case, was symbolic of the curse. It was a place where nothing lives. It was, you could say, a dead end. And there Christ went with his cross to die for our sins. And now we need to see something very clearly, brothers and sisters. Christ was dismissed from God's presence, and so he became unclean. He left the beautiful presence of God, and he entered the ugliness of our lives away from God. Yes, in the dead end of Golgotha, we see our own dead end. But with the coming of Christ, we see a Savior who steps into our lives, who accepts our death, who bears our sins, and who carries the cross in our place, who goes out of the gates of the Lord to us, so that we might enter the gates of the Lord through him. And how do we enter the Lord's gates? We do that by taking up our cross and following him. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ means accepting a cross. It's what we pray at the baptism of each child, that she might joyfully bear her cross and cleave to him in true faith, firm hope, and ardent love. We might ask, if Christ has borne the cross for us, why do we still have to bear a cross? Well, God gave Christ a cross to open the way to him. And God gives us a cross to follow the way to him. And what is that cross? For each person, that cross is something different. For some people, it is a chronic ailment that will not go away no matter how many treatments we try. For some people, it is the burden of a joyless, loveless marriage. For some people, it is a thankless job that we cannot do without. For some, it is the longing for a life partner or for a child that the Lord does not give us. For some, it is the unending grief of a loved one whom the Lord has taken away. For some, it is an addiction that they can never shake free. But one thing it is not. Our cross, whatever it may be, is never a curse. And if we're ever tempted to call it that, then let us remember our Savior who bore the curse of God forsakenness so that we might never more be forsaken by him. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so in him, the hopelessness of the cross is gone. Because we're following Christ, who is leading us into the presence of God, who will take our cross away and crown us with Christ our King. And that brings us to our second point, that Christ our King was discredited for our comfort. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate wrote a title and he put it on the cross. That was quite a normal practice. 
the judge would write a title on a placard, and that title described the crime that the person was being executed for. So what should Pilate have written? Well, he said it three times, I find no fault in him. If Pilate were an honest man, then that's what he would have written. But Pilate was not interested in the truth. What is truth, after all? To admit in public that he had found no fault with Jesus, and yet to hang him on the cross, would be to admit that he had been defeated by the Jews. And Pilate had far too much pride for that. He wanted to save face. And so he wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. To the innocent passerby, it would appear that Jesus was then being crucified as a political rebel, an enemy of the state. The more so because he was crucified between two other criminals as though he were their commander. Did Pilate really believe that? No, of course not. It was precisely on the political score that Pilate said, I find no fault in him. That was a non-issue for Pilate. So why bring it up now? Well, because this is a title with which Pilate could mock the Jews. In the title on the cross, you hear all the sarcastic mockery of Pontius Pilate. Here on the cross hangs the best king the Jews can come up with. Scourged with a Roman lash, pinned with Roman nails, condemned in the Roman language, pathetic like the rest of the Jews, powerless in Caesar's grip. Here Pilate misuses his judicial authority for some political grandstanding. And so the chief priests protested. And well, they should, because this was not justice. But notice why they protested. They protested because many Jewish passers-by were reading the sign. Now, it would have been one thing, perhaps, if, this, if the title had just been written in Latin, the official language of the Roman court. But it was also written in Hebrew and Greek to make sure that everyone passing by would understand. And many Jews would have been passing by. They were arriving in Jerusalem, after all, for the Passover festivities and the week-long Feast of Unleavened Bread. They could all read that sign as they went by. And so the chief priests would have had to enter a thousand questions. They would have had to answer a thousand questions as they went about their temple duties. Who's this Jesus? Is he really the King of the Jews, the Messiah? Why is he on the cross? And the whole city would be in commotion on Passover day. And so they asked Pilate if he would please change the sign. But what do they ask Pilate to write instead? Do they say, write that this man is a blasphemer because he claimed to be the son of God? That would have been in keeping with what they thought. That was what Caiaphas, their high priest, had condemned him for. But no, they only ask for a small change. Write that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. You see, the chief priests were not interested in justice either. Never mind whether he's guilty of blasphemy. Never mind what the people think, so long as they don't think that we have crucified the Messiah. They too want to save face, just like Pilate. But Pilate is not interested in their protests. These Jews have caused him enough grief and with an imperial air of dismissal, he says, what I have written, I have written. Pilate's title stands firm. And behind that title, we see the purposes of the sovereign Lord who makes sure that the truth about his royal son is made known to the world. Here hangs Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Only five days earlier, he was ushered into the city gates as the son of David, the king of Israel. But where could the king of Israel go? David's throne was gone, and it had been gone for more than 500 years already. 
500 years earlier, the people had already mourned the disappearance of David's throne with the words of Psalm 89, which we sang. O Lord, you have removed the scepter from his hand, cast to the ground his throne, him from your presence banned. You have cut short his youth, his vigor you have taken, enveloped him with shame and left him all forsaken. That is the condition of the Davidic throne. It is under God's curse, relegated to the dust of death. And that is where the son of David must go to find his throne and to redeem it. And so he enters into the fallen condition of David's throne. If the crown of David lies in the dust, then it must be recovered from the dust. If there's nothing left of David's throne, then the son of David must become as nothing to inherit that throne. If David's kingdom is obliterated under the heel of Rome, then David's son must be obliterated under the heel of Rome to find his kingdom there. If David's kingship has earned the wrath of God, then Christ must undergo the wrath of God to redeem David's kingship. And so you see that behind Pilate's mockery is the justice and truth of God who discredits his royal son so that on this son he might build his kingdom of justice and truth. What lessons can we draw from this? There are two. The first lesson is this. Let us never fear what human governments can do to us for they are completely in the control of the sovereign Lord. His purposes prevail through them and in spite of them. Do we worry about what a government might do to our freedom of religion? Has God become so small? Truly, if God's purposes prevailed when the king of the Jews was hanging on a Roman cross, how much more shall God's purposes prevail now that the same king is enthroned in glory on a throne that is resurrected from the dust and has all authority in heaven and on earth? There's a second lesson. Christ was crucified between two criminals as though he were their king. That was Pilate's mockery. But here, too, is an element of truth. For who were those two criminals? They were the two who were not released at the Passover. In John chapter 18, we read that the Jews had a custom that the Romans would release one prisoner at the Passover feast. It was sort of a taste of the freedom from bondage that the Passover celebrated. Pilate was willing to play along for a price. And here we see what his price was. Yes, Barabbas was free, but two others would pay the price of his redemption by being executed at the Passover feast. To show that the Jews were not free at all, to show that the message of the Passover was not true at all, the Jews were still in bondage. And yet here at the cross of Christ, God outwitted Pilate. Our Lord brought his son to the cross so that he could pay the price even for a condemned criminal. One of the two refused to believe that Jesus could be his king, but the other one said, Lord Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, Today you will be with me in paradise. There, in his weakest moment, humbled to the dust, discredited by all who saw him, God's royal son opened the gates of paradise. And the first one to enter after him was a condemned criminal. Christ grants release from the bondage of sin. He sets the prisoners free. A human court may declare a prisoner condemned, 
But if that prisoner believes in Jesus Christ and confesses his sins to the Lord, then he believes in a higher authority than the court that condemned him. He believes in a king who can overturn the sentence of condemnation because Christ was condemned in the prisoner's place. That's a glorious gospel message for prisoners. It's also a wonderful gospel message for each one of us. Faith in Jesus Christ means believing in the King of Kings who was discredited for our sake that he might crown us with glory. And now we come to our third point. Christ was also disrobed. We read in our text that the soldiers took Jesus' garments away and made four parts. But they cast lots for his tunic because they did not want to tear it. Some commentators have made much of this tunic. Some have even suggested that maybe this was a high priestly garment of sorts. But there's no evidence for that. A tunic was simply a shirt that was worn next to the skin. Now John specifies that it was woven from the top in one piece. And it seems that special attention was paid to this garment. Why? Probably because it was the only one of real value. The beloved John, the disciple who records this gospel, he was standing by the cross with the women and he was watching as the soldiers gambled for a tunic that he, John, had seen every day on the body of his beloved master Jesus. What must have been going through John's mind as he watched the soldiers gamble for it? Now a nameless Gentile soldier was going to wear that tunic while Jesus hung naked on the cross. What was going through John's mind as he was watching? Did his blood boil? Did he clench his fists in futile rage? Did he have to resist the urge to risk his life and rip the tunic out of the soldier's hands? If so, we don't read about it. And by the time that John wrote his gospel, he had learned that this too was a fulfillment of Scripture. It was foretold in a Psalm of David, Psalm 22, verse 18. There David says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And when you look at the context there in Psalm 22, the point there is not so much the clothing itself as the shame and the vulnerability that comes when the clothing is taken away. It says in verse 16 and 17, Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They've pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat at me. There you have it. The shame and vulnerability that comes with being exposed and naked before enemies. Then truly you are defenseless and open to attack. And to understand this fully, we need to go back to Genesis. In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve good as loving and trusting beings with nothing to fear from God or from each other. But when they fell into sin, they became ashamed and they became vulnerable. And so they covered themselves with leaves. God, when God confronted them for their sin, God did not strip them naked again, but he graciously clothed them with animal skins, more permanent clothing. And ever since then, people have worn clothing, for in clothing, there is a measure of security. We feel protected, we can function in society. Clothing protects us from the shame that came with sin. Clothing is a cover-up in a fallen world where God holds back his wrath so that society can continue to function. Now clothing can hide our shame, but it cannot take our shame away. And therefore Christ had to be disrobed God allowed the first Adam to cover himself, but God did not grant this to the second Adam. He stripped him of his clothes so that he was exposed to all the mockery and the ridicule of a fallen society. 
All around the cross we hear the satanic shrieks of the seed of the serpent as his own people mock him and they glory in his shame. This is their moment of triumph. And Christ did not run away from the shame because he had come to take the shame of sin away. He hung defenseless on the cross and he waited for the onslaught of God's wrath, the punishment for the sins of the world that had been waiting ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the beginning. In the nakedness of our Savior, we know that he died for the original sin of Adam and Eve in paradise. He did that for us. Brothers and sisters, our Savior was disrobed so that he might clothe us and present us before his Father without fear so that we might experience the perfect fellowship of paradise restored. And so we see our crucified Savior in this passage. We see how he was dismissed from God's presence, a discredited king, a public disgrace. That's how he suffered. And he did that so that we might see in his suffering the ugliness of our sin. That's how he suffered. And he did that to reassure us that our sin is fully paid for. That's how he suffered. And he did that so that we might cling to him, our Redeemer and our King. Amen.